It's good to be talking to you today. Um, I'm, it's going to be interesting to talk to you about uh, topics like global warming on a day where it snowed. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, you know, you may be wondering why I'm giving a talk on environmentalism. Uh, you know, because my field is cosmology, astrophysics. And uh, uh, I've always been an environmentalist. Uh, when I talk to environmental, uh, environmentalists, though, I find that I disagree with many of the things that they say, the things that they support. Um, and a couple, of few, a few years ago, I, uh, I realized that there, were, there was no class taught, on, uh, taught at the University of Michigan on energy. And so I started a class called uh, Energy for Our Future. And uh, people from all over, students from all over LSA come to take this class, and they've enjoyed it quite a bit. So I thought I would break from my usual uh, topic for a uh, to talk like this on dark energy, and I would uh, tell you about uh, my views on the environment. So I'm going to talk about responsible environmentalism from a physicist's perspective. Okay. So, not working. There we go. Is this plugged in? Ah, the advancing isn't working. That's okay, I'll just come back here when I need to do it. Okay, so many of you have probably seen this very famous plot that came out in 2001. It was, uh, since 1990, the uh, United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the I, known as the IPCC, uh, has summarized the state, the, uh, the state of climate science, and it's been, their reports are sort of taken to be, uh, you know, the, the, the final word on the state of uh, our understanding of the uh, evolving environment. This graph uh, shows the departures in temperature from some nominal time, uh, in, from 19, uh, an average from 1961 to 1990, so right about there. And that's where things are zero, and it shows deviations in average global temperature. You may be wondering how in the year 1000 we have records of temperature, and that's because we can go and we can see what the temperature was by looking at ice cores and, uh, and things like that. And so, um, uh, and you know, also, uh, you, you can get some historical records from you know, there are historical records of what the temperature was like, but you'll notice that uh, the fluctuations are really large in the past until thermometers began to be used on a regular basis, and that's what the red data is here, and that's in the 1900s, people started using thermometers, and there are records of these temperatures that have been kept. So uh, the first thing you can see here is that things have been, well, kind of steady until the... Um, Industrial Revolution, when the, um, there's been a significant uh, increase in the last century, about, oh, about 0 0.6, 0 0.8 degrees centigrade uh, in, the last, in the last century. And this has, uh, so you may be wondering, um, uh, about the about the data that's in here, because after all, they started using thermometers, um, uh, and where would they use those thermometers first? They'd use them around cities, and so the temperature data from the early 1900s mostly exists because we have records of what things were going on in cities. But cities weren't as developed then, and so there is this issue of whether or not the modern measurements of temperature in those same locations. Uh, apply, you know, can be compared to the data before because as, as cities grow, they, they form like a heat island. You know, there's lots of activity and, the, and, there, and there may be increases. So the, all of this is, is very controversial and it has to be corrected for these factors. Uh, there's a lot of debate about this. This is not something that, you know, you just, it's, it's, it's obvious. It's not obvious. In fact, if you look at a map of the United States about the temperature changes in the last century, uh, two-thirds of them uh, two-thirds of the locations will show a temperature increase, and about one-third of locations will show a temperature decrease. So you can't just walk out and say, oh, it's hot today, the earth is warming. This is something that's very subtle, and it really has, there's a lot of science behind it. It has to be thought about very carefully. So uh, there also, you can see here, there's a natural variability, you know, up and down. Uh, 
that, uh, that is, is comparable to the, to the rise. So this has been called the hockey stick. Where is this? It's been called the hockey stick plot because it shows this dramatic rise at the you know, beginning of the uh, 19th century. OK, so how does this occur? Well, let's talk about how the Earth acquired, what's the, how the, what sets the Earth's th uh, thermostat? Well, we have sun, uh, sunlight absorbed, the sun, solar radiation absorbed by the Earth. There's about an average of 235 watts per square meter um, impinging on the Earth. And some of that goes to heating the atmosphere, and some of that goes to heating the uh, land and the ocean surface, and that's warmed to an average temperature of about 14 Celsius today. Um, some of the heat that's in the atmosphere will go back and heat the surface of the Earth, quite a lot actually, and some will be radiated into space. Now the Earth, it's, it's not the temperature of the sun, so it doesn't produce visible light, it produces, mostly, it produces mostly infrared light, just like you're doing right now, because you're warm, and all warm objects emit radiation. But because it's, it's, you know, the temperature of the Earth is lower, it emits light mostly in the infrared. And the, that, that light, get, that infrared light that's being radiated, some of it gets out into space, but much of it gets absorbed by the by gases such as carbon dioxide, water vapor, uh, methane in the atmosphere. And that puts this, uh, this, some of this heat back into the atmosphere. And so the degree to which uh, the, the uh, infrared light is blocked will certainly determine whether or not there's more heat put back into this, into this greenhouse uh, effect here. And, and it, will, it will control the temperature of the Earth. I don't think many people disagree with that. So uh, let me talk about the major greenhouse gases. Uh, there's water, carbon dioxide, and methane. Uh, this shows the contribution to the uh, uh, greenhouse effect. This shows the lifetime in the atmosphere in years, except this one's in days. Uh, uh, this, says, this is called the global warming potential over 20 years, over 100 years, and over 200 years. And just looking over a period of 100 years, you see that methane has a much larger global warming potential than um, uh, any of the others. Uh, water vapor is unknown because of the uncertainty about clouds and how that works. It's really complicated. So. Uh, uh, the greenhouse gas, as I said, block the infrared emissions from the Earth. If you burn hydrocarbons, you produce CO2 uh, and water because you say you take something like methane and you burn it, uh, you're going to get CO2 and water like that. And if you burn coal, you're going to produce uh, carbon dioxide, no, no water in the process. Uh, but uh, you also produce particulates and ash, which is particularly harmful to our environment. Uh, rotting organic matter. Say you, you leave some vegetables out and you let them rot, uh, that's going to produce methane. And remember what we said about methane. It has a much larger global warming potential than anything else. Uh, and so the question I want to ask you is if you use biodegradable packaging, are you reducing or contributing to global warming? How many people think you're reducing the global warming? How many people you're think you're contributing to it? So what happens when you use biodegradable packaging? It's going to de degrade. It's going to decay into methane. Now, if you put it in a landfill, very few landfills actually reclaim the methane, maybe 20% in a good, a, good a good installation. And so the fact is that if you put it in a landfill, it's going to degrade, and it's going to get out into the atmosphere. The best thing to do with carbon is put it back in the ground if you're worried about, glo if you're worried about global warming. So. Let's uh, see what's been happening to our climate on a much larger scale. This is a, a plot of the paleoclimate. This is the temperature. Uh, this is this delta T in degrees centigrade uh, as a function of time before the present era. And it goes back to 520 million years. And uh, I, I, I don't want to focus on this area except to say that the Earth has been warmer in the past than we could even uh, almost imagine it happening today. There have been times when the Earth has been warmer. There have been also times when the Earth has been very cool, cold. 
And so I want to focus on uh, this part over here. One thing you should realize is that without greenhouse gases, without greenhouse gases, the oceans would be covered with ice. Uh, in the last million years, we've had ice ages lasting 100,000 years typically, you know, give or take, uh, uh, punctuated by interglacial warm periods lasting about 10,000 years. We are 12,000 years into a interglacial period right now. Um, they can tell the retreat of the glaciers by, watching, by looking at the radioactive dating of the carbon dating of ancient Indian ash pits as they followed the game north as the, in Michigan as the glaciers retreated. It's, it, it, it sets up a timeline very clearly. And you can see how the glaciers retreated. So they know, they understand what causes this, these kind of periods here. Uh, there's, they know that there's a precession of the equinoxes, the tilt, uh, and the elliptical orbit. Uh, gives you a 21 kilo-year period. There's a plus or minus one degree wobble in the Earth, uh, which gives you a 41 kilo-year uh, period. And there's an orbital shape variation, which gives you this 100,000-year period. And these kind of beat against each other to give you this kind of uh, shape here. And these are called Milenkovitch cycles. It's well understood what the forcing function is. Uh, I want to also point out that all of modern human civilization occurred after the end of the last ice age 12,000 years ago. We, I don't think humans, although humans have existed since, you know, back here, I don't think we were ready to start implementing uh, agriculture, societies, things like that, until we got smart enough to do that. And that happened in the last interglacial period, in the last, you know, six, seven, eight thousand years. So uh, uh, this is an interesting thing to note. We are living in a warm period, and it's the, that warmth is the reason for us being here, sitting here watching this presentation now. So the Industrial Revolution uh, seems to have caused a dramatic rise in the CO2 concentration. Uh, this is the CO2 concentration. Uh, measured in uh, parts per million. And you can see the Ice Age cycles clearly here. And a question you might ask if you were a questioning type of person is, does the Earth's temperature determine the CO2 levels, or do the CO2 levels determine the Earth's temperature? Not absolutely known. We now believe that for the first time, since we're putting so much CO2 into the atmosphere, that the CO2 uh, is driving the, the temperature, but we don't know that for abs in a, with absolute certainty. It's, 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 it's probably true, but we don't know that with absolute certainty. So, uh, so, so then the next question you want to ask is, is this temperature rise in the last century due to human activity? The IPCC has claimed that it is. Uh, there are people who, serious people, who believe that it is not, that the ocean absorbs lots of CO2 and there's a lot of, uh, you know, that the, the, the Earth is very tolerant of, of increases in CO2 uh, in terms of generating the, te the, the temperature of the Earth. And then the question remains, how much CO2 is too much? You know, are, are, are we really destroying our environment with this? I, I just, another thing I want to point out is that 70,000 years ago, at the peak of the last ice age, we, there was a mile of ice above us here in Ann Arbor, not very conducive to life. Okay. And in fact, at that time, there's reasonable evidence through uh, studies of mitochondrial DNA that uh, there were less than a thousand of us on the planet. We had a hard time in the last ice age. We survived it. Might have something to do with the fact that the ones who remained were kind of smart and could start agriculture. Okay. So, what is the consensus on this? Uh, you know, you can listen to, your, to the politicians, you can listen to scientists. Let's, let's look at two views on this. The debate is settled, climate change is a fact. Uh, President Ob Barack Obama, in his 2014 State of the Union address, said, and I'm going to say, to say all these words, taken together, our energy policy is creating jobs and leading to a cleaner, safer planet. Over the past eight years, the United States has reduced our total carbon pollution more than any other nation on Earth. But we have to act with more urgency. 
because a changing climate is already harming Western communities struggling with drought and coastal cities dealing with floods. That's why I directed my administration to work with states, utilities, and others to set new standards on the amount of carbon pollution our, plans, our power plants are allowed to dump into the air. The shift to a cleaner energy economy won't happen overnight, and it will require tough choices uh, along the way. But the debate is settled. Climate change is a fact. And when our children's children look at us in the eye and, and ask if we did all we could to leave them a safer, more stable world with new sources of energy, I want to be able to say, yes, we did. Okay? Seems like a very reasonable approach to dealing with a potential threat, a very a fairly strong potential threat. And then I read the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> and. Stephen Coonan, September 19th of this year, just a little while ago, says, uh, the crucial scientific question for policy isn't whether the climate is changing. That's a settled matter. During the 20th century, the Earth's global average surface temperature rose 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Nor is the crucial question whether humans are influencing the climate. Continually growing amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere due largely to carbon dioxide emissions from the atmosphere. Uh, in the atmosphere, do large, sorry, from the conventional use of fossil fuels are influencing the climate. He says, rather, than the, rather, the crucial unsettled scientific question for policy is, how will the climate change over the next century under both natural and human influences? And he, then he goes on to say, we are very far from the knowledge needed to make good climate policy. And he goes on to point out the deficiencies in the climate models that are used to make these predictions. For instance, he points, out to, uh, he points out about shrinking, uh, it, it basically can't predict very much. The models do not predict things. They don't predict the shrinking Arctic sea ice or uh, the comparable, uh, the, the uh, 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 a lack of a comparable amount of uh, Antarctic uh, uh, sea ice increase and uh, the Arctic, uh, the Arctic uh, uh, Antarctic uh, continental ice uh, is, uh, is decreasing. And uh, then he um, goes on to say that uh, the uh, lower, uh, the, there's, there's, there's basically no tropical hot spot in the, uh, in the um, uh, tropics that has been predicted, hasn't, hasn't appeared. Um, and uh, he, uh, uh, there, the, uh, uh, the rate of global sea rise hasn't, hasn't uh, in, in the, in the uh, last century hasn't met the expectations um, uh, from seven, you know, 70 years ago. Uh, it's, it's as large as it, as, as it is today. Um, and so uh, the other thing is it doesn't predict climate sensitivity um, properly. Uh, today's best estimate of the climate sensitivity, in other words, what happens if you double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere? By how much will the temperature change? Uh, uh, we don't know. The prediction is 2.7 to uh, 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, uh, that's no different or no more certain than uh, it was uh, 30 years ago, despite uh, literally uh, billions of dollars of research being done. We don't know. We just don't know those things. So the question I have to ask is, who is right? I have to ask who is right about the, you know, I mean, there's two diverging points of view. And I have to admit that I'm a little prejudiced in this because it's between a politician and a scientist. Okay? <laughs> and not just any scientist. Uh, Steve Coonan was the, uh, some of you may know he was the undersecretary for the Department of Energy uh, under uh, Steve Chu during the Obama administration, uh, his first term. And he's currently the director of the Center for Urban Science and Progress at NYU. Um, uh, prior to that, uh, you know, he's a serious scientist. He was the chief scientist of, uh, of BP prior to that. And before that, he was a professor of physics at Caltech. Um, he did nuclear physics. Um, I, I know Steve from when I was a freshman at Caltech. He lived a few doors down from me, across the hall. We were friends. And uh, he was the smartest kid there. <laughs> he was absolutely the smartest kid there. And by his senior year, he had finished all the graduate classes they had to offer. 
And he went off to graduate school at MIT. In two years, he solved the most important problem in nuclear physics at the time which is a time dependent hartree fock calculation of the nucleus. And he returned as an assistant professor two years after he graduated as an undergraduate to Caltech. So he is not someone who can easily ignore when he evaluates things. Now, uh, both Obama and Kunin based what they said on the uh, 2013 IPCC report. Uh, President Obama relied on IPCC's summary for policymakers. Uh, while Kunin based his remarks on the contents of the report. He, re he actually read it. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> so after he went through this, he concluded, and this, so it's, it's the IPCC report that he's, ba they're both basing it on the same thing, except in one case, he actually is basing it on the contents of the report instead of the executive summary, which, by the way, does not reflect the contents very accurately. So he says, these are fundamental challenges to our, to our understanding of human impacts on the climate, and they should not be dismissed with the mantra that climate science is settled. Okay? He says, any serious discussion of the changing climate must begin by acknowledging not only the scientific certainties, but also the uncertainties, uh, especially in projecting the future. Recognizing those limits rather than ignoring them will lead to a more sober and ultimately more product, productive discussion of climate change and climate policies. To do otherwise is a great disservice to climate science itself. Right, quite reasonable, right? He says, uh, uh, so now you have to understand upon the release of this Wall Street Journal article, Kunin was denounced by many environmentalists as a climate change denier and an agent of BP. He doesn't work for BP anymore. When he was there, he, he worked on low carbon technologies. <laughs> you know, uh, that's what was, that was his emphasis. Um, also, the word denier is a heavily politically charged term. And I'm actually offended when people use it. Uh, it brings up the, the, uh, the specter of, of Holocaust denier or something like that. And what it does is it shuts down uh, discussion. Because no one wants to be called a denier, right? And yet, that term has been used uh, by many environmentalists to describe people who disagree with everything that's, that they believe in. And they... Um, uh, and, and the people who use this term are not only, you know, are our political leaders, many of our political leaders, including President Obama, uh, but also uh, many of the scientists that are on the IPCC, some of whom are faculty members here at Michigan. I've heard them use the word. I think it's just a bad thing to do in general. So let's, let's look at things like the sea level rise that o President Obama talked about. The rise in the 20th century has been eight inches, the rise of the sea level. Uh, the IPCC estimate, I want to start something before I go on. I forgot to do this. I'm going to put some ice in here. OK. And I'm going to raise this. Let me, let me get this on the screen. Is it on the screen? Oops. Yeah. Uh, there. Ice. Ice. There we go. <laughs> OK. I'm going to set this to, uh, to that mark at 3,000 milliliters. And, there's a, and it's melting. Then. It's, it's, it's going to melt. And I just, you know, in case you get bored of what I'm saying, just, uh, just watch that. See what happens to it. Notice the ice is floating above the surface a little bit. It's like an iceberg, right? So it's about 10% above the surface. Let's let that sit and melt. OK. So uh, now the IPCC estimates, estimates that the rise uh, by 2100, you know, 100 years you know, over a century, will be 7 to 22 inches. Uh, and most people don't understand that this is not due to the melting of the glaciers and all this other stuff. It's due to the expansion of water. You know, if you heat the oceans, they're going to get, it's going to have a larger volume. And, and the water is going to rise. Let me just show you that. OK. 
Okay, here we go. So what we have, you can see the water's up to here. I'm going to turn this torch on. And up goes the water, right? Water expands. That's what this is due to. It's not due to the, the glaciers and the and Antarctica melting, Green, Greenland melting. It's not due to any of that stuff. Okay, so they predict 7 to 22 inches. Now, floating sea ice melting, as you will see as you watch this ice over here melt, and I'll put it back on that, ice. That level will not change. And it doesn't change as the ice melts. This is physics. Okay, I'll explain it to you afterwards if you want. <laughs> sea ice melting does not change the level of the oceans. Okay? Continental ice can. Okay? Okay, so uh, uh, here's a question for you. Is that if the Earth is warming, do you expect Antarctic continental ice to increase, decrease, or stay the same? How many people think it's going to increase if the Earth is warming? How many people think it's going to stay the same? How many people think it's going to decrease? Okay, so let me explain to you why you're wrong, okay? <laughs> and why the models predict otherwise. If you warm the Earth, will there be more or less water vapor in the atmosphere? More. Where's it going to come down? where it's cold. It's going to increase the amount of ice in Antarctica on the continents. Okay, that's the prediction of the climate models that predict the dire consequences for global warming in over the next century. Okay? But what has happened is that the Antarctic continental ice is decreasing. NASA sent a satellite over that measured gravity, the gravity and measured the amount of ice that was, and they came out with this big report that said that they measured a decrease in Antarctic ice and used it as evidence for global warming. The models say otherwise. But it seems that anything can be used to, to, to uh, any, a, a, all, all bets are off in terms of, of uh, using data to, to, uh, to uh, um, confirm your, your dogma as long as, you, uh, as long as it works. If it doesn't work, you ignore it. And that's not science. Okay? So, in fact, uh, the Antarctic, Antarctic continental ice is decreasing contrary to the original expectations. The Arctic sea ice is decreasing as expected. So the other thing that Obama said is that we're suffering from violent storms as a result of global warming. And I show here, if you merely look at the number of violent storms, category four or five storms that have been discovered, what you will find is that the, they have been rising rapidly over the last century. Okay? Why do you think that's the case? Satellites. There's more commerce also. There's more boats crossing the ocean. They notice the storms out at the ocean. They catch them in, with satellites now. And of course, you're going to catch more that never reach landfall. And so in, the, in history, in the, you, you will, would not have seen those. You would only see the, see the ones that happened to be going by when a boat passed by and, and a record was kept. Or you would see the ones that made landfall. So if you take out all of the violent storms in the last century that have not hit, you know, you only include the storms that have hit landfall. And there's category three, four, and five, and categories four and five in black there. Uh, the question I have to ask you is, when you only take these hurricanes that make landfall, to, to take out the bias of modern measurements, uh, is there any evidence for an increase in violent storms in the 20th century? Can anyone see a rise? That shows the number of tornadoes. Of course, you're going to see those. You know, there's going to be a record of those. Do you see any indication that there's an increase in tornado activity over the last century when the CO2 was increasing and the temperature was rising? Okay. 
So Katrina was actually a category four five storm, five storm out in the ocean. When it reached landfall, it was category three. It caused a tremendous amount of damage. Tremendous amount of damage. It was the most expensive hurricane ever. But it was a category three storm when it made landfall in 2005. Most of the damage was done by the levees breaking. The levees were weak, and that failure was caused by the storm surge, a standard storm surge from a category three hurricane. So the local disaster preparedness was totally inadequate. You don't rely on the federal government for the first few days. You rely on the local responders. Those of you who do volunteer work know that. It's the local responders that get there first, and then the federal government can come in and help. Uh, that didn't keep people from beating Bush over the head over this, this thing. Uh, but in fact, the local disaster preparedness was totally inadequate. And the fact that they were constructing half of New Orleans below sea level was also not a good thing. Yeah? Not good. So uh, since 1971, the Army Corps of Engineers attempted to build a hurricane barrier. And in 1977, the work stopped due to a Save Our Wetlands lawsuit. Okay? In 1985, they just gave up. They just gave up. They decided, forget this hurricane barrier. Uh, we'll just kind of try to strengthen the levees. Uh, it was a decade of court battles. They just couldn't deal with it anymore. And then eventually Katrina hit, and the levees were weak, and they failed. This doesn't mean that we need to ignore the warnings about greenhouse gas emission. It just means we don't understand the impact of it. But what we do know is that there are potential really serious things that can happen with a warming Earth. And they, we can reach tipping points, potential tipping points. We don't know when that might occur. We don't know uh, at what temperature it will occur. We don't know much about this at all, but they're sufficiently serious that we need to take note. So here are these tipping points. One of the possibilities is that the Antarctic ice sheet would slip into the sea. You know, it moves slowly, and now you can heat things and lubricate it potentially at some point. It could slip into the sea and melt. Another possibility is that Greenland might melt. And uh, the fresh water would, would disrupt the Gulf Stream cause huge changes in temperature over populated areas of Europe. Um, that's also a possibility. Uh, this is a serious thing. Methane could be released from permafrost in the north. I mean, after all, there's all this rotting organic material that's been frozen in there. It warms up, comes out. Methane's a really powerful greenhouse gas. Not too good, right? could lead to runaway warming. There's also the possibility there are methane hydrates at the bottom of the ocean that are basically methane water ice. Under high pressure, low temperatures, that's what, that's what methane does. And there's methane seeps, by the way, all over the ocean floor. Actually, life grows around those methane seeps. It's interesting. So uh, uh, if the temperature of the ocean gets too hot, that methane could be released. Huge amount of methane released into the atmosphere, completely change our temperature of the Earth, we become Venus, we perish. Okay? Not good. These are all very dire predictions, but they are possible. So all of these could trigger a runaway greenhouse effect, but the problem is um, we don't know. We don't know uh, what the time scale is for this to, be, to, to happen. What do you think? Do you think the time scale is 20 years, 200 years, 2,000 years? Or maybe 2 million. Ah, we don't know. That's the thing. We don't know. Science is incapable at this time, right now, of predicting when these things might happen. They're actually incapable of predicting precisely what the temperature rise would be if you inject so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The models are bad. And that's what Kuhnin was trying to say. So, but our president says at the 2014 climate summit, he said, for all the immediate challenges that we gather to address this week, terrorism, instability, inequality, disease, there's one issue that will define the contours of the century more dramatically than any other, and that is the urgent and growing threat of a changing climate. 
he's, he's right and he's wrong. It is a threat. But we don't know what the threat is. So what do you do when you don't know something? You study, you do research, right? So you invest in that kind of research to see if you can improve climate models, if you can, can you know, improve the predictions, if you can you know, understand the, the, the science of this more, okay? Do you go running off and make major uh, policy changes that will impact uh, our economy in a big way? Or not the economy of the world in a big way? Should you do that? Yeah. Some, people yeah. believe, some people believe that it's better safe than sorry. Some people believe that it's very be better safe than sorry. And I, you know, I, can, I understand that argument. I understand that argument. On the other hand, it's very nice for us being safe here in Ann Arbor with our nice standard of living and everything to say, let's, let's go ahead and let's change the whole price structure of energy in this world. Because we're not going to be as affected as that person at the very who's living in uh, the, the suburbs of China, you know, in the, in the countryside of China, or living in a, a third world country, who then suddenly can't live anymore. You know, so these are big decisions. These are not decisions that have to, that can be taken lightly. You can't just go ahead and disrupt, you know, the global economy based on possibilities. But you can try to do more research and try to figure out what's going to actually happen. And you can take modest measures that are not uh, as costly as, you know, will not cause great pain and suffering around the world. So anyway, I just want to say that there have been former, uh, there, there have been previous uh, crises in the climate uh, and in uh, the availability of, of energy. Uh, and so let's see how we got into this predicament. So, uh, during the oil crisis of 1850, there was a problem. Whale oil was being used for lamps and candles, okay? Uh, it was in short supply. It was very important. People had to go to bed when the sun went down if they didn't have candles and lamps. Okay, so this was a, this was a problem. And, uh, you know, some of you, how many people have read Moby Dick? Okay, I had to read it in high school. They made me read it, right? <laughs> Maybe it was junior high. I forget. But anyway, uh, you read about Moby Dick, and they were hunting whales out of every port, you know, out of every port in the world. They were, they were sending, whaling ships were going out, and they were, you know, getting these whales. And uh, um, they were being hunted to extinction. Uh, at that time, there was alternative energy for the lamps. There was oil from coal, but that was too expensive. Extracting the oil from coal was too expensive. Make, you know, making it, you know, doing uh, gas, uh, uh, ma making uh, coal to oil was too expensive, as it is today. Uh, alcohol, it was chemically unstable. It caused fires. Uh, lard oil, it was smelly. People didn't want to use lard oil. So there was alternative energy. But then what happened? So uh, this was a really bad time for whales. They would hunt these whales. They had these ships go out. They would get the whales and they would, many of them were brought to the Falkland Islands. And the Falkland Islands doesn't have much vegetation on it. Um, nothing to burn. There's no coal, there's nothing they can burn. Except for one thing. Because they had to render the whales into oil. So we put them in these big pots, <laughs> giant pots, and underneath they would light a fire. And they would heat the, the whale meat and, uh, and the oil would you know, separate out and then they would uh, uh, take it off, and then that's, that's, how they, that's how they produce the oil, and they ship that around the world. And they needed a source of fuel, and so what they did is they used penguins. Penguins were really fatty, and they burned very easily. So what they did is they had these corrals, they would get the penguins into the corrals, and they would be packed in there, you know, and then they would open a gate to the bottom of the pot. And the penguins would be pushed into the fire, and they would burn, and they could control the rate at which the burning took place by controlling the size of the gate and how many penguins were tossed onto the fire, uh, you know, per unit time. So, what happened was that in 1853, Edwin Drake sank the first well for rock oil in Pennsylvania. It's called rock oil, and it began to replace whale oil for use in uh, lamps and candles. And at that point, 
the slaughter of the uh, whales and the penguins was dramatically reduced. <laughs> and so next time you're thinking about big oil, remember that they saved the whales. <laughs> and the penguins. See how happy the penguins are? So what followed was that in, you know, over the next uh, you know, uh, 15 years or so, John Rockefeller built Standard Oil into this uh, you know, empire controlling 90% of US refining. He made a standard oil that you could put in the lamps. You know, so it burned steadily and it had you know, definite properties. That's why it was called Standard Oil. In 1882, Edison invented the electric light. So lamp oil wasn't needed anymore. But uh, what happened then was new oil uses for oil were, was found. In 1886, Ford built the first uh, automobile. In 1896, the Model T began to be mass produced. And uh, he formed a monopoly, a vertical monopoly that the Supreme Court broke up into Exxon, Mobil, and Chevron, companies you know today, uh, in 1911. Energy has been the driving force behind modern civilization. With electricity, lighting extends the day, it increases productivity, uh, it permits leisure activities like this one. Okay? Uh, sanitation, very important. Child mortality used to be awful, absolutely awful, until they developed uh, water and sewage treatment and that reduced disease, dropped the infant mortality, increased our lifespan. You know, many of you, including me, are here because the lifespan's been extended. Uh, refrigeration prevents food spoilage. Uh, more people can be supported from farmland located outside the cities. Uh, modern appliances, such as washing machines and dishwashers, you know, they freed us from the overwhelming housework that they used to have. I mean, that's you know, what people used to do all day. They just wash things and cook things and prepare their, you know, food. And then there's oil for transportation, and automobiles allowed freedom for freedom of movement. And uh, trucks and trains, they transport the good and the food, which increase the efficiency of production. Uh, and you could transport food from, you know, and the countryside to the cities, and people could live in cities. Uh, and location of work and home could be separated, because you could commute. Okay. So uh, heating and cooking reduced deforestation, as you, if anyone's ever been in a third world country, you know that there are lots of fires that are due to, uh, you know, cooking accidents. Um, and in the U.S. and most, most of the world, the population and the standard of living has grown steadily. Uh, oops, what happened? <laughs> Some, something doesn't like me. Uh, there we go. Okay, has grown steadily uh, along with the energy supply. So it's allowed us to develop the population we have now, and uh, we now depend upon it. Cutting off that energy supply, unless you're willing to go home every day and not turn on your light switch and not turn on your stove and not use any of these things, you're not willing to do that, right? Yeah. yeah. You are voting for, in a sense, for what we have, the way in produ we're producing energy today. You're, make, you're voting with your fingertips. And so uh, how much energy, the question results is how much energy is required to sustain the growing population of the world? Uh, you know, at some decent standard of living, whatever we consider decent today. hundred years ago, maybe it wasn't so you know, it wasn't so, you know, our, our standard of living would be like kings, but, you know, what we consider decent now is, is what we, we want to continue. And the developing world wants to do that too. So, the CO, so CO2 production, as you might expect, in the developing world has been rising very quickly. You can see over here, in the annual emissions in billion metric tons of CO2, as a function of year, you can see that We've actually done conservation measures in the United States, and despite growing population, we have uh, reduced our uh, CO2 emissions in the United States. But in around 2006, 2005, China surpassed us in CO2 emissions and continues to grow exponentially. Why? 
because Chinese, the Chinese people aspire to the same standard of living that we have here. And they say to us, you're telling us we can't burn coal, we can't burn f fossil fuels, uh, and yet you have the standard of living you have now because you did that. And now you want to tell us we can't. And there are very poor people that make all of our stuff, by the way, and we've exported a lot of our pollution to China. You know, and, and they make our stuff, and then they don't get much back for it because we can't pay them what they want because we have to borrow money from China to keep our standard of living high. <laughs> I, you know, they have a point, right? <laughs> so the question here that I'm going to ask you is if you care about greenhouse gas production, where is the best place to invest your money? Do you have money to spend on trying to reduce, mitigate greenhouse gas production? China, right? It's the place where you can you get the most bang for your buck. If you're trying to reduce global, pollute, global greenhouse gas production, you get the most bang for your buck. Not only because that's where they're producing it. Anything we do here you know, can only be an example. That's all. Uh, but in China, that's where the CO2 is being produced. If you want to reduce the CO2 uh, emission, what you do is you invest money in China in reducing, of course, that's not going to go over well with the American people, <laughs> but you'd like, to reduce, you'd like to reduce it in China. And uh, the, other, the other reason in China is it, doing it in China is so good is because the labor rates are so low. You can actually build things cheaper in China. Solar panels come from China because they're late, they, they earn a dollar an hour to make them. And the pollution that goes along with production of that stays in China. And we're happy with that for some reason. Okay. Here's what we do in the United States in terms of energy usage. Uh, by the way, a quad here, which is the units of this graph, this is, ma this is made by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. This, the latest one is 2012. Uh, a quad is 10 to the 18th joules or 2.8 times 10 to the 11th kilowatt hours. Okay. The U.S. uses 95.1 quads. That's a quarter of the energy usage in the entire world. Okay? That's what we use to maintain our standard of living at what we like to, what we like to have. Okay, and you can see the different uses of it. Mo petroleum mostly goes for transportation, a little bit for industrial. Coal is the biggest source of electricity generation. Natural gas is the, uh, uh, well, natural gas is the next largest one, and then uh, nuclear is the next one. Hydro, and then you see small amounts of wind and solar being used. And this shows where it ends up at the end of the day, used for residential, commercial, industrial, and then there's rejected energy. Anytime you run a heat engine, you, you, dump, it, you dump heat into the environment. It's, it's inevitable. It's a phys law of physics. Okay? Uh, and then you get the, some fraction of that energy out. So let's go through some of these. You know, coal, it's cheap and dirty. That's, that's coal. It's, it's readily available. We, we, we mine it. 42% of U.S. electricity production in 2012, which is declining now, mostly due to natural gas production. And it's natural gas prices are coming down. Does anyone know why they're coming down in price? Natural gas? Fracking, yes. Uh, you know, coal comes from accumulation of, it's really solar power. <laughs> it's a, it's a natural, it's a, Organic material that's been uh, that grew under that's been buried under anaerobic conditions and compressed is you know hundreds of millions of years ago. It's pre really preserved solar power. And the sun beat down, made the plants. Now now they're produced. They're they're buried. Coal is cheap, uh, and it's also plentiful. Uh, and uh, uh, per per megawatt hour, it only costs forty three dollars. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Greenhouse gas that it produces is larger. It's 3.7 tons of CO2 per ton of coal. Scrubbers can be used, but you know, that can remove most of the particulates, the fly ash, all the dangerous you know, emissions from coal plants, acid gases and poisonous heavy metals, like mercury and stuff. Anytime you burn something that comes out of the ground, you're going to get heavy metals. Because you, know, you burn away the carbon and the oxygen and the nitrogen and all that stuff. What are you left with? You're left with the heavy metals, right? And they go off in the ash. And of course, if you have the residue of that ash and you put it on the ground and it rains, that's that, those metals are going to, like mercury and things like that, arsenic, they're going to go into the rivers, you know, into the water supply. Um, so you produce all this liquid and solid waste. Coal has a very slow response, many hours, and that's why it's used for baseload power. 
you know, the, ba the base load power generation that we need. Um, it has a very high capacity factor. You can get good thermodynamic efficiency by burning it. You grind it. If it's anthracite, you can grind it up and blow it into these furnaces. It has the highest death rate, 15,000 people per petawatt hour. By the way, all forms of energy have a death rate. So you can calculate this just by adding up all of the deaths that occur as a result of operating that plant, mining the stuff, the health effects that occur, and uh, you can figure out what the death rate is per petawatt hour. Okay? Nuclear fission, 21% of US electricity production in 2012 came from that. Basically, you enrich natural uranium in, in uranium-235. It's enriched to 3 to 4%. And it's used for use in a reactor like that. It's a very simple device. You got, you got uranium. Neutrons are emitted. Uh, they, uh, they turn the uranium into plutonium after a couple beta decays, and neutron capture a couple beta decays. You turn it into plutonium, and you generate, and fission fragments are produced also. And, uh, and then some of the plutonium gets burnt, too in the reactor. Um, so uh, the cost of a, of, a, of a nuclear power plant is very high, billions of dollars. If you need a, if you need a cooling tower, another couple billion dollars. They're, they're very expensive. Uh, that's why they try to locate them near water so they can you know, dump the heat. All power plants have to dump heat. So uh, uranium is very cheap. It's very plentiful. Uh, $24 per megawatt hour production and distribution cost, 20,000 gigawatt hours per ton of uranium-235, that's six million times what you get from coal. Millions, because it's nuclear versus atomic scales. It's, it's millions. So there's essentially from the power production, of course, there's always greenhouse gases produced when you make a plant, you know, the production of concrete and things like that. But from the power production, this is really zero greenhouse gases that come from nuclear. The waste storage is done on site or it's buried with minimal risk. Those show the casks for long-term, low-level radioactive waste storage after they've been cooled. Um, and uh, it can be stored on site or buried with very minimal risk. Uh, the uh, nuclear reactors have the slowest response time, days. Can't turn them on and off easily, although France does that. Uh, they do throttle their power plant. They use 80% uh, nuclear power, uh, and they reprocess. Uh, they have the highest capacity factor. They're very good for base load power. You know, just producing you know, any kind of fluctuations, not good for that. They have the lowest death rate of any power source, 90 per petawatt hour. 90 people per petawatt hour die as a result of nuclear, all, including all the accidents and everything, based on the accidents and the known cancer versus dose rate. Uh, of course, there's a public fear of accidents and waste storage. There's all this fear, and that, that prevents uh, it becoming, that prevents the possibility, you know, it, what it does, it makes it difficult to finance the billions of dollars that are required to make a new power plant because of this fear. Now, natural gas is cleaner than coal, and it has a very fast response. 24.4% uh, of US electricity, uh, the, you have this associated natural gas is found in oil fields. You just take the gas off the top. And, uh, or it's non-associated. We actually have natural gas fields, like in the Soviet, in the, in, in, in Russia, they, they have these big gas fields that they take the natural gas from. There's also shale gas, which is called tight gas, and, uh, or coal seam gas, and it's extractable, extractable through hydraulic fracking, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, natural gas is more expensive right now than coal, uh, but it's becoming more plentiful in time because of fracking. And, uh, it's about a $49 to $80 megawatt per megawatt hour production distribution cost. Uh, it produces uh, twice as much uh, power per, uh, per ton than coal. Okay? Uh, also, the greenhouse gases are lower than that of coal. It's only 2.75 tons of CO2 per ton of natural gas. So this conversion that's happening from coal to natural gas is a good thing for greenhouse gases. It reduces the amount of greenhouse gases. And the other thing is natural gas is completely burnt. Uh, so it leaves no ash, and that's good because it doesn't have all these heavy metals and things that contaminate our environment. And it has a very fast response. It respond in a minute. And it uh, has a very high capacity factor. So it's, both, it's good for both baseload power and peak power generation. So it's great. Uh, it has a very high death rate, just like coal does. 4,000 people per petawatt hour of production. And this is how a modern combined cycle gas plant works. You have actually, you, you recover the, some of the energy and you run a secondary turbine, so you get two, two shots at the energy. So you, you know, 
uh, you, you have these combined cycle plants. And those are expensive plants, but they're very efficient, incredibly efficient. They also have to be cooled. So I just wanted to say, oops. Okay. So, um, hydroelectric power. It's great, but only 7% of US electricity is produced that way. We've kind of tapped out all the places you can put a dam up and you know, run it efficiently. And so that's the problem. We, you, know, you can't, can't get more of it. They're very limited sites. Uh, the expansion is just not possible. Uh, there's uh, basically zero greenhouse gas from, oh, this, this, the, the ice, you see it's melted? You see? You see? Water didn't go up, didn't go down. Oh, now it's starting to boil away, right? Ah, uh, let it boil. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll turn it off. There we go. Okay. Uh, uh, you have a, it's, it has a moderate capacity factor because it's really used for peak power, because it's so useful for that. Uh, you got to release the water during rainy seasons, and there's li limited power during droughts. But, you know, when you need power, you can, you can just release it and get some power out. It has a very low death rate. It's just based on infrequent accidents like dam collapse. Uh, but dam collapses can be pretty serious. This is an example of the Three Gorges Dam on the upper right. China's built this giant dam. Wind farms. Wind farms, you know, wind is great. Wind is free. You know, but the, plant, but the wind turbines are very expensive. 3.6% uh, of U.S. electricity is produced uh, by, wind farms in two th by wind turbines in 2012, but it's rising rapidly. We're building lots of these. Uh, the power goes like the velocity cubed. Again, I'll tell you this afterwards if you want to know how, how that works. Uh, so most of the power is generated during gusts. You have to have high wind speeds or gusts. To, to get this, and so it's only available in certain areas. Coastal areas are very good, coastal winds. The Great Plains winds grow very steadily from Texas up to Canada. You can see that band of good wind uh, capability. Notice Michigan uh, along the lakes are very good. You know, the, 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 lake, the lake winds are really good. So the, what you want to do is you want to do wind in areas where there's a lot of, you know, wind. <laughs> and uh, they have a very low capacity factor because winds don't blow all the time. Uh, they usually blow in the early morning when the power is not needed. That's not good. Uh, it would be better if they blew when we needed it. And the backup, they have to have backup for the 70% of the time when the wind's not blowing. And usually that's done by natural gas because it can turn on and off quickly. So don't think that when you set up wind turbines, you're not generating greenhouse gases because you've got to have the backup to provide the, you know, the, the backup power. And it's usually done by natural gas. The cost of the plants is very high, and it has to be heavily subsidized at present uh, to be economically viable. Um, there's a low death rate based on very infrequent accidents, uh, 150 per petawatt hour. There's public concern over bird kills, noise, block. It blocks the views in Cape Cod until, until Kennedy died. They couldn't put the, on Cape Cod, they couldn't put a wind farm up. They just put it up in 2010. They were, you know, because people would complain that it blocked the views, and, and Kennedy would prevent the wind farm from going up. But that's, as you see, that's a really good area for wind along Cape Cod. So, um, but the, the business with the birds is a red herring. 0.4 million birds are killed annually by the wind uh, turbines, compared to 3.6 billion per year by cats, <laughs> and 976 million per year by buildings. Those are estimates. Okay, but just it's a it's a you know it's a comparison. So don't talk to me about birds. Maybe you can talk to me about eagles. <laughs> Geothermal power. Only a tiny amount of our power is produced that way, and it has to be produced in limited sites where the, there's hot spots. It's otherwise not efficient enough to to make it worthwhile extracting. So the heat flux has to be much higher than average there. Uh, it's limited by water supply because you know, the water comes out and then you have to put water down there and so they buy sewage from surrounding areas and put it down there and then they run out of sewage and you know, they, they have trouble. Uh, the greenhouse gas production is very low, 60 to 90 pounds per megawatt hour. has a very high capacity factor but, uh, the, and the geothermal plant production costs are the same as most any other kind of plant. And uh, so 
you know, it's very useful in those places where you actually have a hot spot. And so geothermal can be used, but it can only be used in certain places and it's very limited. So then there's solar power, and uh, that's 0.1% of the US electricity. It's rising rapidly, mostly due to the availability of very cheap Chinese solar cells. Okay? Because people work for a dollar an hour there, and the pollution that's created in production of solar cells stays in China and affects the Chinese people, and we don't seem to care about that. Okay? Uh, they're very intermittent. Solar power is not available in the early evening hours when it's most needed. Uh, uh, they have a low capacity factor, 10, 12 to 20 percent. Uh, due to night, sun doesn't shine at night. Weather, like today. <laughs> uh, um, and also, you have to have solar tracking, which gets, makes it more expensive. Uh, you don't need that, but if you don't have it, you get lower power. And that leads to uh, a need for a backup thing, just like wind, where you have uh, natural gas usually used to, to back up. So um, it's the most expensive plant costs, solar power. Uh, even so, because the construction is expensive, if you construct it here. If you do it in China, it's cheap because the labor's cheap. But if you do it here, it's expensive. And uh, it has to be heavily subsidized to be viable, just like the wind. Um, and uh, uh, sunlight's free, but the maintenance costs are actually high. They have a 10 to 20 year lifetime, so you have to keep replacing it. Um, there's a low death rate based on very infrequent accidents, but I just want to say here in Ann Arbor, when the University of Michigan tried to install solar panels up on Plymouth Road, it was very natural to do it there. They had a natural gas plant at the North Campus location where Pfizer used to be. So you have a gas plant ready to go to back up the power. You build solar panels, which during the day when people are actually in, in the facility there, could actually provide power, and then you have the backup by the natural gas at night, it was actually a very natural thing to build solar power there because you had an existing natural gas power plant uh, at the old Pfizer facility. But you may remember what happened when they installed the solar powers at power panels up there. People started complaining. Oh, they were unsightly. They think they should, they should build, they should put trees around it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, we want our power, but we don't want, we don't want to see it. We don't want to uh, have it in our community. It's like any power system they don't, we don't seem to want. Anyway, I just want to talk a little bit about conservation, because it's the energy solution that, that pays interest. <laughs> we call it megawatts. Okay? Uh, there's an effective interest rate, which is 100% divided by the payback period minus the depreciation rate. This is the interest that you would get by investing in, in something okay, that saves you energy. So the payback period is just the cost divided by the annual savings, and the depreciation rate is 100% over the lifetime. That's the rate at which it depreciates, okay, the lifetime of the, whatever you do. So here's an example. In 1998, I installed an attic fan in my house okay, uh, to save on air conditioning costs during the summer. It was really hot. It's gotten cooler since then, but it was really hot back then. And so the cost was $400. I bought it at Home Depot. I self-installed it. It cost me $400. I saved $200 for the months of July and August, which is $400 a year. The payback period is therefore one year. Okay? So the lifetime is 20 years, so the depreciation rate is 5% per year. So the effective interest rate I got on that investment was 100% per year minus 5% here, which is 95%. What a great investment. Okay? Whenever you can do something like this, do it. Okay? There was a report by the McKinsey Group uh, on greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. And uh, these are the abatement cost curves uh, beyond you know, business as usual. And you can see on the left things that pay, pay interest by investing in them. All those things should be done. Right? On the right are things that actually cost money but will abate greenhouse gases. Uh, this, this tells you what the abatement potential is in gigatons per, of CO2 per year. Uh, and you can see that things that are, um, and that's the abatement cost, which is per, uh, you know, this is per ton of CO2, what it costs per ton of CO2. And so um, what's the significance of the area uh, 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 of the boxes? Well, if you multiply the abatement potential in gigatons of CO2 per year times the cost per ton of CO2, you get the, uh, what do you get? You get the cost, okay? And so as you go, the area tells you how much it costs. 
And so the things that you could do, you should just do the things to the left there that are negative. You know, but the things to the right, it, it is an increasing level of cost. And you can see somewhere in there are plug-in hybrids that end up costing lots of money to actually implement, which you choose to do if you have that money and you want to save greenhouse gases. Of course, that's not actually true, because when you plug in your electric car, where are you getting your electricity from? Power plants. <laughs> in, in Michigan, it's mostly coal and nuclear, but mostly coal. OK? OK, let me hurry up. <laughs> OK. The demand varies through the day. And the way in which you uh, uh, deal with that demand variation is to uh, basically turn on uh, things in order, like this. First you turn on uh, renewables, then nuclear, then coal, and the things like that. And that's how we manage our power. It's done by, uh, uh, by uh, these uh, independent service organizations that are, uh, you know, they're, not, they're, they're a, a nonprofit, and they basically buy power from power plants. So the way in which you can deal with this demand fluctuation there's four solutions. You can turn on and off the power. That's really not an efficient use of the power plants. Uh, idle plants don't advertise the costs. Uh, this is what we do now. Uh, you can modify the demand structure by having smart grids, dynamic pricing, so the price depends on when you're using it. And uh, that requires a big, large infrastructure and changes in public acceptance. It's possible in the near future. Uh, there's energy storage, which is pump storage, batteries, supercapacitors, hydrogen fuel cells, things like that. But these are technology improvements that you need to do research on to make them effective. They, are, they really are not available. They, you know, some pump storage is available now, but only in certain sites. And, uh, and then there are solutions that can be achieved by combining baseload power and, uh, and uh, say, geothermal storage or something like that. So there are things you can do. So let me just say pump storage is about 80% efficient. You've got to pump. When you're not using power, you can use the plant to pump energy up into, you know, water up into a reservoir. You let it go, and you get uh, power out. You can use batteries. Batteries are incredibly expensive. They also have a limited number of charge discharge cycles, and this is why they're so expensive. They have to be replaced all the time. It's really not ready for prime time, battery storage. Uh, and the reason for that is that when you use batteries, these dendritic structures form on the electrodes, and eventually they can't be recharged anymore. And trying to understand this is a very important part of battery technology that needs to be worked on. Uh, I'd like to just point out that this theory of diffusion-limited aggregation that causes this thing uh, was first proposed by uh, Whitten and Sanders, who's a University of Michigan professor here in physics. So I just want to say there are mixed technologies. You can do bedrock heat storage. You can dump heat into the bedrock. Basically, it provides a, a source of geothermal power. If you can, if you can you know, run your plants straight out when power is not needed, you put it down into the ground. Um, now, there's also oil needed for transportation. Our whole way of life in the United States has evolved around the availability of cheap imported oil, okay? individual transportation, uh, suburban living, trucks for distribution. We have a decaying rail system as a result of this. Uh, domestic oil production is limited. We have to import our oil. Um, alternative transportation systems have really not been developed in this country because of the availability of very cheap oil. You can see that our demand for oil has, has continued to, uh, you know, uh, our production has, has dropped, our demand has gone up, uh, we have to import our oil from places in the world that we would rather not import our oil from and dump our money into. Uh, this has been a bad thing. So there's been a demand for drilling, uh, exploiting our own oil resources in the United States. And so well, how many of you remember the Deepwater Horizon BP oil spill uh, of, uh, four years ago? Okay. Do you remember seeing the pictures of oil washing up on the Florida beaches along the Gulf Coast? How many people remember that? Okay. Okay. Which most correctly describes the number of animals of all kinds killed by this oil spill? Raise your hand when you get the right answer. 500. 5,000. 50,000. 500,000. 5 million. OK. Well, let's actually see what happened. In April 20th, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded. 11 people were killed. 17 were injured. Oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico at an enormous rate. You've seen the pictures. 
Uh, it was 41 miles uh, from the Florida coast. Obama said it was the greatest environmental disaster of its kind in our history. He closed 50,000 square miles of ocean to fishing, and he, put, and he set a moratorium on deep uh, water drilling. In July, uh, less than three months later, the BP engineer stopped the flow one mile below the surface, an absolutely amazing technological feat. I, I, I don't think there are any, there's any other group could actually do that. This is an amazing thing. They were ready for something like this. They were able to get the stuff down to the bottom, make, drill into the, into the bore and, and inject stuff into it. I mean, it was an amazing feat. They did it in less than three months. They stopped it. So in July of 2000, uh, uh, in, in BP, they hired the un now unemployed fishermen to, uh, to set out uh, barriers to protect the beaches and deploy surfactants to, uh, to protect the beaches from oil. Over here, oh, thank you. We have some wave action going, and I'm going to put some oil in here, and I'm going to show you how surfactant works. Ready? See, it breaks up the oil into tinier pieces. You see it's starting to break up. And wave action then breaks it up further, and bacteria can then attack the oil and degrade it. So that's what they did. They hired the, the fishermen to do this and, uh, and deploy the surfactants and, uh, uh, to break up the oil. Uh, David Axelrod, the presidential advisor, called this the greatest environmental catastrophe of all times. 250 million gallons total oil spilled in three months into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there were 6,814 animals killed. Is that a lot? Many of you thought it was much higher, right? Um, the um, U.S. Travel Association estimates that uh, it affected over 400,000 travel and industry jobs. 23 billion in tourism was lost over three years. BP spent 11.2 billion sealing the well, 22, 20 billion in compensation to the victims. Oops. And 408 uh, billion in, uh, sorry, 40 billion in lawsuits, uh, and 100 billion in stock value. Okay. Uh, in the end, the oil never reached the Florida beaches. It never reached the Florida beaches. Some went to the bottom of the ocean. Of the Gulf of Mexico. Some was broken up by the dispersants and eaten up by bacteria. Uh, shortly afterwards, uh, oil and uh, dispersants are now undetectable. Undetectable. The fish and the shrimp are thriving. There's been an explosion of fishing yield. And that's why? Because they stopped the overfishing by closing the Gulf <laughs> and putting the fishermen out of business. <laughs> they, the fish population exploded, and now we have more sea animals than we ever had before because of the stopping of the overfishing. It's humans that do this stuff. Okay. This is how soap works. That's how that's working over there. Uh, my cells, uh, soap, the surfactant detergent molecule, has a polar head and a uh, nonpolar tail. And so when you stick this in water, the nonpolar tails go inward to get away from the water. And the water, of course, which is polar, you know, it, it, it keeps the, you know, these things pointed this way, like so, you see? And so if you drop oil in the water, where's it going to go? It's going to try to avoid the water, and it goes into these little micelles. Okay, so that's how a dispersant works. That's how it happens when you wash your hands every day with soap and water. That's how, that's how it works. Okay, so let me just go on, because I do want to talk about fracking. Fracking is an amazing technology that was developed has lots of pros and cons. You drill down, and then you turn the drill sideways, and you drill into a shale deposit. Then what you do is you inject under very high pressure oil, uh, w sorry, water, uh, detergent, like this, and sand. You crack open, hydro you know, hydraulically, the shale, and the sand goes into the little cracks, and it keeps them open, and then out comes natural gas. Okay? Now, the problem is you have to go through a water, you know, water uh, table to do this, and they have to line the well appropriately so that you, know, you don't get stuff into the water table. Uh, but you can extract natural gas that way. And this is a huge, huge uh, uh, change in technology. Uh, this shows you the global shale uh, gas reserve estimates in these various countries. The total reserves come to something like 66, uh, 22 
terracubic feet. It's sufficient to last us 100 years. The US has 11 50 terracubic feet, maybe up to 3,000. China has enough for 450 years of their energy production. So there are pros and cons to this. There are possible benefits. It allows the transition to, from coal to natural gas, uh, which has half the greenhouse gas potential per unit energy, uh, half the greenhouse gas uh, uh, per unit energy. And it enables a shale oil production. Uh, it hasn't been done much yet. We'll more about that later. The US could become a net energy exporter if it exploited this, uh, and is a stable energy source for hundreds of years. The environmental concerns are multiple. There's contamination of groundwater. Anytime you put stuff underground and bring stuff out, you're bringing out all sorts of dissolved bad stuff, you know, mercury, arsenic, things like that. And you know, it's the same thing as digging up coal and burning it. So uh, you can get contamination of the groundwater if you don't seal it properly. Uh, there's migration of the contaminated fracking fluids to the surface. Uh, there's spills of the contaminated fracking fluids. Once you can take the fracking fluids out, you really want to recycle it uh, and put it back in the ground where it belongs. Uh, there are risks to air quality. My problem with fracking is that it provides an entirely new way for us to continue to dump CO2 into the atmosphere for the next 400 years. Okay? Otherwise, in the short run, it's pretty good because it reduces the amount of CO2, it reduces the amount of coal that's used. So uh, I have very mixed feelings about this. I, oops, I hit the wrong button. Okay, I just want to say something about nuclear waste. People are very afraid of nuclear waste. But nuclear waste, we understand the effects of radiation extremely well. If you take high level waste, it consists of two types of things. There's fission fragments that decay very quickly, highly active, very radioactive. After five years, they're gone. So you put them in a pool, it's, it's thermally hot. You allow them to cool off in a pool at the reactor site. And by the time that happens, all of those highly ra radioactive things are gone. And all you have left are the long-lived things. And because they're long-lived, they don't decay very fast. And so they're, 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 they're low radioactivity. Mostly it's plutonium, uh, which lasts 24,000 years. But you really should recycle the plutonium like the French do. Anyway, you can vitrify this and put it in cask storage on site. It's not dangerous at all. Uh, or you can do it in deep, deep, but you can bury it. Uh, and unfortunately, Yucca Mountain was in a very nice site to do this, but it was shut down for political reasons. Okay? This shows the, the, the reduction of radiation as a function of time based on background level of, from the ore in which it's mined. And so you can see that after 10, uh, 100 years, uh, you've reduced it to the point where it's 100 times the background level, which is very low, by the way. And if you have a 10% chance of 10% leaking in your storage facility after that period of time, then you've basically reduced it to the background level. It's much less than that, of course. But uh, look, the, the fact of the matter is that no matter what people like to say, uh, you know, nuclear waste disposal is a solved technical problem. It can be done. We know how much radiation causes cancer. These, this is the Bayer report, the effects of ionizing radiation. They get this from the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. We know about, we followed people that were a certain distance from the bomb blasts. We know what, how many cancers they got. We can subtract off the background cancers that they would have gotten anyway, because we know what the natural rate of cancer is in the population, it's about 20%. And that's subtracted off, that's why the error bars are so large. Because you, even though you have a lot of people, you've got to subtract off this other large number, which is the number that get cancer anyway. As I said, 20% of people die in their lifetime. What this curve is telling us is that you get one cancer for every 2,500 person REMS. Uh, so if you receive 250 REMS and live, you know, that's the lethal dose, the LD50, the lethal dose 50% die at 250 REMS. But if you receive 50, 250 REMS and live, you have a 30% chance of cancer in your lifetime instead of 20%. Okay? That's large, but it's not that large compared to the natural dose. So if you get the most amount of radiation you can and live, you know, then that's, that's what it's telling you. So the, this is a linear hypothesis. It's very conservative. And I, I just want to tell you that there's radiation around you all the time. Let me take this out. Turn this on. What you're hearing there are cosmic rays coming down. 
natural radiation from space that comes down all the time. But there's also radioactivity in the rocks. This is uranium ore. It has more radiation than most things. This is some more ore, rocks. This is manganese. These are thorium welding rods. If you go camping and use these camping lantern mantles, there's the thorium in the camping lantern mantles. If you use a smoke detector in your home, it's sealed. But you have radiation in there. This is uh, potassium chloride pellets used in a water softener. Okay? There's radiation everywhere. So, we have natural radiation affecting us all the time. Breathing gives us 228 millirems on average, just breathing, for a year. Uh, cosmic rays give us about 33. Eating and drinking, water, we don't want to stop that, right? Uh, that gives us 28 millirems. The rocks around give us about 21 millirems. And sleeping, we're radioactive too. Sleeping next to a friend for a year <laughs> gives you two millirems of radiation. Okay? So there are, there are guidelines. An additional 500 millirems per year is considered safe for the general population. Five rems for a radiation worker based on those bare guidelines and a linear extrapolation. Um, Remember, 200 rems to the whole body results in radiation sickness, and a whole body dose of 250 to 350 rems will kill you. A dose of 2,500 rems will certainly kill you first, but it would give you can one dose of cancer. Okay, that's how things are. So it's often said that any excess cancer from radiation is unacceptable. What do you think? No, oh, come on, we go to the doctor, we get x-rays, we do all sorts of things, and we do it because it, it may benefit us. But just, just living gives us radiation. Uh, so radiation is used in imaging and diagnosis, radionuclides are attached to biologically active molecules to cure our diseases, uh, and we destroy cancer cells with radiation. And so I, I just want to give you an example of this use. Uh, Fukushima, you remember Fukushima, it was a big tidal wave, killed a whole bunch of people. Uh, there were something like uh, 18,000 people who died from the earthquake and the tsunami. They were buried under rubble. What was the attention? What did people pay attention to? Explosion. The hydrogen explosion in the nuclear reactor, okay, that then released radiation, okay? <coughs> Let's figure out how many people, based on this Bear report, uh, got uh, cancer, as will get cancer as a result of this. Well, using the linear no threshold Bear data, they did a study that showed that out of the 127 million Japanese people, 127 million, an estimated 130 extra cancer deaths occurred as a result of the radiation release from Fukushima. Uh, over the next 50 years will happen. Uh, so that's to be compared with the 28 million cancers that would have otherwise occurred in that population. Okay? So there were 761 victims of disaster-related death, especially old people who were uprooted from their homes and hospitals due to the forced evacuation, in addition to the 18,000 people that were buried under rubble by the tsunami. I think it's a little silly to be focusing on the uh, devastation of this reactor. I mean, you should learn from it, but it's a little silly when 18,000 people are buried under rubble to worry about, uh, you know, uh, some tiny increase in the cancer death rate in, in, in Japan. It's incredibly tiny, so, uh, seven, uh, 130 out of 28 million. Okay? Of course, if you lived around Fukushima and you were in your hospital bed dying of cancer, wh what would you blame it on? You'd blame it on the reactor but only in 130 cases out of 28 million would you be right. Of course, you don't argue with dying people, right? Okay. So I just want to say that climate scientists have come around, some of them, uh, to support nuclear power. Uh, these, these, are very, uh, lead, these are leading climate scientists, James Hansen, Ken Caldera, uh, Kerry Emanuel, and Tom Wigley. They released this open letter uh, in 2013 calling on world leaders to support the development of safer nuclear power systems. And you can read it here. They say, to those influencing environmental policy but oppose nuclear powers, climate and energy science concerned with global warming, we are writing to urge you to advocate, uh, to advocate the development and deployment of safer nuclear energy systems. We appreciate your organization's concern about global warming and your advocacy of new renewable energy, but continued opposition to nuclear power threatens humanity's ability to avoid dangerous climate change. Okay, these are the climate scientists. 
So I just want to say that people are starting to turn around about nuclear power. There are all sorts of new systems like small modular reactors that are incredibly, um, that, well, they can be buried. They're completely safe. You can bury them in the ground and they're basically a heat source and you can use them to get a few hundred megawatts of energy. Um, there's a pr there are promising new technologies where you use a combination of nuclear power and you can extract shale oil, like I said, you know, you can break down the carriagen, you know, after you frack, you can actually break down the carriagen and get liquid fuel so we can fuel our automobiles, uh, at least for the time being. It turns out that 330 modular reactors could provide 100 million barrels of shale oil a day, which is the current U.S. import rate, okay? And the U.S. has these enormous reserves of shale oil and shale gas. So I just want to end by saying, how can you become a responsible environmentalist? Well, your primary motivation should be environmentalism, providing a good environment for our offspring, and uh, not activism. You can be activist, but your primary motivation should be to preserve the environment. Your primary motivation should not be activism, and then you just, you know, environmentalism is a tool that you use for that activism. So you should inform yourself about the details of environmental science and acknowledge the uncertainties that are inherent in any, in any science. You should recognize the uh, environmental concerns. Uh, these environmental concerns don't exist in a vacuum. There are reasons why we have evolved to the society we have, mostly economic. Uh, any sudden change will result in human misery. You know, there are people at the bottom of the economic spectrum that if you make a choice to make energy more, more expensive, they will die. They will not have food, they will not have you know, energy, they will not have anything, they will die. They won't have good sanitation. You have to understand that. So there's a trade-off. It's not one or the other, it's a trade-off. So uh, you should understand that any policy you come up with involves risk and you, learned, you need to learn how to evaluate risk in a, in a fair way, you know, by comparing different risks in different, by different, for different policies. You shouldn't advocate popular knee-jerk uh, positions that actually end up harming the environment something that I see happening all the time, as you can see by some of the examples I've given. You should listen to those who disagree with you and avoid inflammatory words like hoax or denier, things like that. And, uh, you know, argue in a respectful way using science rather than emotion to back up your case. Convince people of your argument. Um, so you should, you should support expenditures on research, on climate, conservation, next generation power systems, and energy storage technologies. And you should join with other responsible environmentalists to support an expansion of safe, clean, uh, environmentally friendly nuclear power. Uh, you should also be willing to accept that you might be wrong. Just like every scientist has to do when they, when they come up with a discovery, you have to acknowledge that if someone comes and finds that you made a mistake, that can happen, and your most cherished beliefs you know, might be wrong. And so you have to be willing to accept that. It's called deniability. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we practice in science, and that's what I would like the general public to, to how, how I'd like the general public to approach climate, climate issues, environmental issues. Okay, thank you.